Well, good morning. Welcome to the Firehouse. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Steve. Uh, good to have you this morning. Pre-Merry Christmas. You know, hope to, yeah. Am I all done shopping? <laughs> I'm not done yet? Honey, pick it up. Uh, I don't like the strain of not having all my gifts bought. You know what I'm saying? So, so anyway, I'll edit this out. But uh, it's good to have you this morning. We're going to continue on with the series that I started. Uh, it would be uh, six weeks ago, but last week we didn't talk about it. It's entitled The Long Con. And again, if you haven't heard any of the sermons, you can go online to the Firehouse Chapel YouTube channel and watch everything that you want. But let me give you the definition that we've been looking at. This is week number five. Let me give you the definition, what, according to the dictionary, what the long con means. And it says this, an elaborate confidence game that develops in several stages over an extended period of time wherein the con artist or the swindler gains the victim or the mark's trust, often passing up smaller profits with the goal of reaching a much larger and higher payment in the final maneuver. The base scripture that we've been looking at is in the book of Acts chapter 7, verse number 41, when Stephen, right before he's about to die by stoning at the hands of the religious leaders, he stood, and in my opinion, gave the greatest uh, uh, sermon, dissertation, speech, whatever you want to do, that I've ever heard presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ before those who are about to kill him. But here in Acts chapter 7, verse number 41, he, this is the specific thing that we've been looking at over these past five weeks. When he said after Israel, Moses went up to the mountain, they got scared. And they said, oh, please, we need to make ourselves a, an idol. So they made one fashioned after the one that they just left in Egypt. Because God set him free from captivity. Keep that in mind. And it says that according to what Stephen says. He says they brought sacrifices to it. To the calf. And they held celebrations. In honor of what they had made. With their own hands. This goes in direct conflict with God. With, with God. Man elevating man above God is a sin. It was never designed to be that way. We are to elevate God above all things. He is the ruler and the authority of all things. He owns a cattle upon a thousand hills. All the gold and silver is his. He is in charge. He is the great creator. He fashioned the universe. But yet man has exalted himself above man over and over and over again. Exalted himself above God, I should say. We left off in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I won't read it, but you can look it up if you know it's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And here, as the Apostle Paul is talking to young Timothy about being in ministry in his church that he's pastoring, he very emphatically, but yet passionately, I believe, Paul said to Timothy, In the last days, perilous times shall come. Men will become lovers of themselves. Verse 5, then he lists a bunch of things, but then in verse 5, he says, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Paul, in my opinion, is prophetic in this statement that he makes to Timothy. Timothy has taken it as great advice, and so he should. But Paul is also very prophetic because if, I, if you were just handed this today written on a piece of paper, you would swear that somebody spoke it today rather than 2,000 years ago. Because as Paul so prophetically says, in the last days, men will become lovers of themselves. All you want is you. You don't need anybody else. You don't need anything else. And for sure, you don't need a higher power called God to surrender your life to because you have it all together. And it also says they'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And folks, that is just filling the hearts of Americans today. And I believe with all my heart, the American church is going to stand, uh, stand in judgment for how we have taken something so precious, so wonderful as the, as the opportunity to know the gospel of Jesus Christ and have the ability to freely worship according to our Constitution and our Bill of Rights, that we have this freedom, but yet... We are ignoring it. We are treating it like toilet paper. And we're treating it like something that we should, no big deal. And we're becoming more self-centered and self-pleasing and self-attitude than ever before. I've, and, and being 66 years old, I, 
I've seen a lot of it, and I just see, as Paul states, the man will become so much more loving of themselves, desiring pleasures for themselves. Instead of following after what's written, for example, and I could spend days reading the scriptures that, that pertain to what's wrong with this, but here's one that stood out to me was in Psalm chapter 66, verse number 5, where the psalmist writes this, Come see what the Lord has done. His awesome deeds to mankind. I can only speak for myself in experience and in experience of being in ministry and being a Christian for as long as I have been. I have found that the people who held on to their, their salvation with both hands as tight as they could are the ones that realized the price that was paid on Calvary. When we realize that the God of heaven sent his only begotten son to die and suffer a brutal death. I don't want to get ahead of myself because, you know, Easter's coming. <laughs> Do you realize how brutal the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was? Watch the passion of Christ. He depicts it really well. Do you know why it had to be that brutal? Because the wages of sin is death. The sacrifice had to equal the brutality of what he was being sacrificed for. When you get that in your heart, instead of up in your peanut, carrying around here like some academia person, when you start to carry this within your heart, I'm going to tell you something. You will hang on to the salvation that God has blessed you with, with both hands, forsaking all things. Why? Because of the fact He has done so much. Come see what the Lord has done. Come see. That should be a testimony of every person that's a believer in Jesus Christ. Come in, let, let me tell you what Jesus has done in my life. Instead of saying, hey, let me tell you what I've done for my own life. He says, look at his awesome deeds to mankind. See, we have, and look, we have this mentality. Look at what we have done. Man, let me read this because I don't want to mess it up. Man has transformed man into God instead of allowing God to transform mankind. See, we've made ourselves gods, captains of our own ship, the, the, the uh, head of our own destiny. We have done that. Instead of God transforming our lives, we are transforming our lives to put ourselves above God. I hope this pierces our hearts. I hope this convicts us to the place where we surrender. And that's the only way you're going to truly know God is when you surrender. If you keep just praying a prayer and nothing's happening, I'm going to guarantee something to you. You're not surrendering. You're not giving up. You're not laying it down saying, I've had enough of myself. I've had enough of my dreams, my desires, my plans, my purpose. I've had enough. When you start to say, Lord, here it goes. I'm leaving it at the foot of the cross. When that starts to happen, your prayer time, your prayer life will start to grow. Your faith in Christ will start to grow. Why? Because you're surrendered. See, I believe that this kind of mentality is alive and well for sure in the secular world, but is also in the church, within the church walls. This morning, um, I, I went to pick up Jeff and, and Jake. I got to their house a little early. It was about quarter to seven this morning. And so I'm sitting in my truck and I got the radio on and it's dark out, you know, and uh, I, I, I got the Christian radio playing and I'm just listening. I got my, you know, close my eyes. I like to listen to music sometimes with my eyes closed. It, it, that's frowned upon when you're driving. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I find that I can, if I close my eyes, I, I hear better. You know, I, can, I hear better. And, and you young men, married, uh, unmarried, whatever, old man teaching young, if your wife ever says to you, honey, we need to talk, don't close your eyes. <laughs> Trust me. But I, I listened to this song. It's entitled In the Room. I've heard this song hundreds of times. The, the version I was listening to was from Maverick City Music. Really cool song. If, 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 I'm in the if, if, if I'm in the heaven, God is there. If I'm on the earth, God is there. 
there was a line I kept hearing. I'm like, what, what, is she, what, what is she singing? Never heard it before. So I looked it up. And here was the line. I wrote it down. If I make my bed in hell, he's there. No, he's not. No, he's not. You make your bed in hell, your bed's on fire, bud. You are condemned to an eternity without God. There is no way Jesus Christ is going to come visit you in hell. It doesn't happen. But playing on Christian radio by a Christian group, singing Christian songs, there's that one little line in there, well, if I'm in hell, I'll make my bed in hell, he's there. No! No! Now, there's, you know, big theological debates. Did Jesus ever go to hell? Did he have to go to hell after he died? I am the, you know, I don't want to debate with you. I, you can think whatever you want. I think he went there. I think he went there, grabbed that sucker around the throat, grabbed the keys from him, slammed his head against the bar, ding, 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 for three days until he said, it's open, bye-bye, I'm out. Never to return again. I believe that. But anyway, that's my faith. But the fact of the matter is, he ain't never going to hell again. So we have it in the church. We have it in the Christian music. We have transgenders getting up on the Dove Awards and, and worshiping God together. People, pay attention to what's going on. You see, this, you see the pieces all moving around, don't you? I do. Like, ah, oh, you know what? I've given up on this one, but I'm going to move this one now. And now the, the swindler, the, the liar, the great deceiver. He's making moves and people are just like. Ugh, uh, uh. That's translated like, I don't care. I'm not paying attention. I'm too stupid. Whatever you want to take. See, the long con, the devil empowers man. Elevates him above the Lord. We are to, we are to approach God with trembling. Not like, hey, yeah, I'm here. Hey. No, man, you're trembling in your heart. Why? Because he's God. He is the great I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the one who has started, spoke the, the universe into existence. He's the one that breathes breath into our lungs and gives us life. We just haphazardly go up to him and go, hey. I've said it before when I hear on the Christian radio when churches are advertising their casual worship service. What do you come in your pajamas? Oh, we're just casually going to worship God today. <laughs> Let's all just casually worship Him. <laughs> Yay. Where does it say? Book of Revelation, I believe. Isn't it chapter 4 to one of the churches? He said, either be hot or cold, or I will vomit you out of my mouth. Hot means you're hot. Cold means you want nothing to do with it. But you ain't casual. See, the long con is passing up the smaller gains to await a much larger payout, and that payout is today. I see it today happening more and more. I see it. I see people walking away from their faith, compromising their faith for whatever reason. I see people thinking, oh, it's no big deal. This is a, that's one of the greatest deceptions of the enemy when it's no big deal. Really. It's no big deal if they use the scripture in the wrong way or if they change the words in the Bible. No, it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. It is a very big deal. See, the harvest of souls for hell's gain is now, in my opinion, like a bullet train out of control. See, I, why we're a rescue station and what we believe is we're here to tell you the truth. To prepare you for an eternity. Where will you spend it? With heaven? In heaven with Jesus and God and his hope and mercy and grace? Or are you standing there awaiting the gates of hell to open to welcome you with open arms? There is a harvest of souls going to hell and it's going quicker and quicker all the time. 
Our internet is breeding that. We have false prophets. We have false teachers. We have false prophets. We have false theology. We have experts on TikTok. We have experts on all these other social medias who aren't really experts at all, but everybody takes it like, oh, wow, that really makes sense. What's it making sense to you? What part is it making sense to you when you hear something? Is it making sense to the spirit of God that you carry inside of us? Or is it making sense to your earthly mind that is always constantly combated by this world? Where is it making sense? That's why a few weeks ago I said I worry about academia and the whole academic thing, not only in the secular world, but also in Christian schools and seminaries or whatever. It's all become a mind thing. It's forget about the heart thing. It's all a mind thing. It's all how do I feel? Where It's all about my feelings. It's all about me putting my mind to rest. So, you know, I, I, don't, I can't walk around with that guilt of, uh, you know, I, I ran into somebody who was actually at a funeral. I run into a lot of people at funerals. And then people are always telling me, oh, pastor, I'm going to come to your church. If every person at a funeral told me they're coming to the church, we'd have all three of these banquet rooms completely full. Funny, though, I never see them. See, because after we're done looking at the dead person, everybody goes, that was close. It wasn't me. Everybody's like, yeah, I'll just go back to the way I was. I'm all good. Whew. Missed that bullet. But I had one person tell me, at least they were honest with me, and I appreciate it. This one guy told me, he says, he, he walked away from the Lord. He, he did. He just psh, walked away. Now, some people may say he was never saved. You can say whatever you want. I believe the guy had a relationship with Jesus Christ, and he allowed sin to come in his life and decided to walk away. So you can do your theology thing, whatever you want to do, but that's how I see it. You know what he said to me? Ever since I walked away, I don't feel guilt anymore. I don't feel guilt anymore. There's a medical condition that's coming to me, not the name, the thought. It's better my thought comes to me than to you. Can you imagine? But anyway... There's a, there's a thing where you lose, you don't feel pain. There's a condition where people don't feel pain. They break their finger or break their arm. They don't know they broke their arm because they don't feel pain. Some of you are like, wow, I'm married to one. So, boy, that would sure be nice if I didn't have to feel it. No, you actually don't feel pain. What's bad is you can be damaged. You, you can damage something in your body and not even know it. When you stop feeling guilt, you're damaging something. And the Bible says to have a worldly guilt is just because you got caught. But to have godly sorrow leads to what? Repentance. Lord Jesus, here I am. I'm a sinner. I seek your forgiveness, your hope. Your mercy, your grace. I confess my sin to you. Therefore, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. I lay it down. It's like the brakes have come off society, church, and have finally embraced. The church has finally embraced the same things. The church has lost its saltiness. Its light has been dimmed. And with the result of that, Depravity is allowed to just reign free. For example, and what's frightening is it's being accepted. I've been telling my wife recently, you guys know I'm, we're from Pittsburgh, right? Home of the six-time world champion Pittsburgh Steelers. Not having a stellar year this year, we're not talking about that. <laughs> But lately, I have been, I've been saying Pennsylvania is a good state to be from. Not that I mo moved into some Taj Mahal in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks ago, this happened in Pennsylvania, and then just recently, the other day, it happened in Virginia. But in Pennsylvania, it was a woman who won the school board president of a school district. Did you see this? Her husband, what you, normally you put your hand on the Bible and you swear, you know, you're, you just take your oath as a school board president on the Bible. Well, she had her husband, she had her husband hold a stack of explicit sexual books that are trying to be banned from the school because parents held that and she put her hand on those and she took her oath with such smugness such cockiness, such boldness. 
And people applauded her, her power, her, 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 her bravery. And then some dipstick the other day, this dude just did the same, put his hand on explicit material and took his oath. Folks, these are our kids in the school. If you think your kid's okay and you don't have to check in on them, you need hit in the head with a brick. Because your kids are under attack. If you think you, they're, they're not, go give your kid to an adoption agency. Because these are the people that are guiding the ship of your kid's education. And that horse, some people are like, I, I don't see the problem. You don't, no, I, I guess you don't. It's real hard to see the problem when your heart has gone dark. I didn't go to Penn State. A friend of mine who will watch this later did. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, he's gonna. It's gonna break Greg's heart. Sorry, Greg. Penn State. I was recruited by Penn State, but I didn't go. Penn State last week. Do you see this one? They brought in Dev, uh, Dylan Mulvaney, the Bud Light transgender poster child. Brought him in, paid him forty thousand dollars to do a one-hour speech on what it means. Something about what it means to be a woman. Everybody's like, that was so brave. That was so brave. In fact, you need to pray for that young man. He looked horrible. Like he's about this big around. I'm, I'm being serious. I'm not joking around. Do I believe in what he's doing? No. Do I believe Penn State are a bunch of idiots? Yes. But him as a person and as a soul, he needs prayed for. But it's being accepted. And people are like, what's the big deal? Live and let live. And then you got these educators, these, these presidents of universities. <laughs> Can't say that anti anti Semitism is bad. How hard is that? Well, it's hard for me to say that. It's bad. It's evil. As it would be to say if you wanted to wipe out all the Arabs or all the blacks or all the Asians or all the all, all the Caucasians or all the Indians. It'd be bad no matter what. But they can't say it. They go blah 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 blah. And they can't say it, and yet people are like, oh, this is great. This is great. This is, remember, I did, I said a few weeks ago, our educational system, our world of academia is part of the long con. It is. I've always said about college, I always said I hated college. I hated college because there's a lot of wasted time, a lot of stupid stuff, and there's a better way, in my opinion, to get an education but people need, want money to pro provide for their universities. I, I, I mean, there's good ways to learn, and there's also stupid ways to learn. Our universities have not only figured out a stupid way to learn, they figured out how to make you pay for it and go in debt and feel guilty. I can't send a little Johnny to Harvard. I can't send him to U of I. It's going to cost me $60,000 a year. I can't do it. I'm a terrible parent. I fed him all his life. I clothed him all his life. I took him to the dentist all his life. He got orthodontics done. He got all this. He broke his arm. I paid for that. But I can't pay for college. It's terrible. It's colleges have figured that out. It's amazing. It's the long con. And where's God? God is told to stay outside of campus. Don't bring God on the campus. Keep him over there. That's where he's allowed to go. See, one of the reasons, I want to hurry. One of the reasons I believe all this is happening aloud. I've had time to think about this since last week, two weeks ago. Evolution. Evolution. Evolution has been taught, or I should say, has been shoved down the throats of young lives for 70, <clears throat> 80 years. All generations that are represented here this morning 
have had to answer questions on test saying this is how it happened through evolution. You're told false information that has never been proven. In fact, when I went first to the university on, on my scholarship, my, my class I took was cultural and physical anthropology. A new Christian, and I questioned everything. And every time I asked a question, I was shut down. When they found a cranium of, of, of what turned out to be a pig, and they said it was 40 million years old, and found out it used to be a pig farm, and it was a pig that just died a couple years ago. But everybody jumped on that and said, oh, yeah, that's one of them. See, it's been shoved down everybody's throats. You know what evolution does? It's very simple. Evolution denies creation. If you deny creation, you deny the base of life. Because life didn't come from God, it came from evolution. Man receives the glory. Man can say, look how far we have come. We have come from swinging in trees by our tail, or we've come from that little amoebic acid that got struck by lightning and the Big Bang happened. Look how far we have come. And therefore, we never have to give God the glory. Not in the, Psalm 66, that come see what the Lord has done. No, come see what we have done because evolution has denied mankind. It has really been dehumanizing. You don't call babies in the wombs babies anymore. We call them fetuses. Or we call them a, cell, a ball of cells. It's easier that way to abort them. We don't call lives that... Are, that was born a boy and born a girl. We can't call them boys or girls. No, let's call them a pronoun. Why? Because then we dehumanize them. Then we start pumping drugs in them and changing them and doing uh, gender alternative surgeries on them and, and watching these things happen. It's okay because they're just, they're just a thing. Do you understand? Do you see this happening? And the church remains silent. The church can't, we can't as a Christian nation, we can't as Christian people remain silent. You got to do something. You got to get close to God. You got to pray. You got to get on your knees. You got to intercede. You got to stand in the gap. Sometimes you got to square your shoulders off. But you got to do something. What came out of that? Secular humanism. Secular humanism is a system of beliefs and values that are opposed to the values and beliefs of tradition and religion. Very simple. That's what came out of evolution. Secular humanism. Out of this, we have spawned, I don't know if any of you have heard this term, free thinkers. Anybody know what a free thinker is? Like, I wish someone could pay me to think. I'd be like, that'd be totally awesome. But I do it for free. That's why when I donate my brain to somebody, it's like barely used. I've tried to avoid as much thinking as possible. But there's this thing called free thinkers. Let me tell you, because this cracks me up, and everybody's like, oh, this is, this is just wonderful. It's just, it's just amazing. I want to be a free thinker. A free thinker is this. People whose thoughts and beliefs aren't based upon fact or reason. So when that little boy's born and you the doctor pulls him out and, you know out of you know and there he is and the doctor looks and goes boy okay and then he pulls another one out of the abyss and there's girl that's biology that that's but that's fact okay a free thinker doesn't think that no they don't even know yet no, they do. It's, it's, it's right there. One's got multi-directional firing. The other does not. <laughs> How about it? How many of you ever changed a little boy? Always have a wash rag, right? Because those little suckers, they can be hitting the drapes across the room. You never know what's going on. I'm just saying, right, Dave? You know what I'm saying? Their thoughts aren't based on fact or reason. There is no, get this, I, this is my definition. There is no room for religious views, morals, or standards. Let's just get rid of all the morals and standards of religion. Let's just be free thinkers. Free thinking is whatever man thinks is right, 
even with no facts or evidence to base it on. Is that today or what? Whatever man thinks is okay. Whatever man thinks, it's fine. You don't have to worry about it being backed up with any evidence. For example, <laughs> did any of you hear about the climate su summit in Dubai last week? The climate summit in Dubai. You know where Dubai is. It's way over there. Now all these mucky muck climate people got on their jets. One country, I don't want to say which country because I forget which one, but it was in Europe, sent three delegates to the, it was, I didn't want to say it. Yeah, is it? For sure? It's England. Yeah, I thought it was. Sent three of its representatives to Dubai for the summit. Well, they all couldn't make the same flight, so they took three jets. Three separate jets to go to Dubai. And our little boy, our boy, I'm so proud of him. Good old Johnny. You know, Johnny. John, boy. John Kerry, you're the best. You are. No, come on. You're a dork. <laughs> he flew over there on his own private jet. And there are all these Brainiacs or so-called brainiacs that applaud each other. This was when I watched these clips I was like this is like the long con played out right in front of us. So I, 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 want, I want to hurry so first of all what they all decided for us That by 2050 all fossil fuels will be gone Well, by 2050 I'll be dead so use me as Fuel I want to have a Viking funeral on the Cal Sag and you know, flaming arrows and all that. So just don't let the arrow go, hit the cow sag because all of Chicago is going to burn down. But uh. Okay, wait, I got to hurry. This one, this one really good. Now trees, streams, plants, and other veg, uh, vegetation, they are putting together now a bill of rights for them. Wait, oh no, this, no, no, I'm glad. I'm glad, and Steve, I'm apologizing to your mom right now because I'm going to use the M word, and she doesn't like me to use it. I'm a moron. I like being a moron because I don't think like this. So here, let me say this. People will become the voices, the advocates, for those who can't speak for themselves. Like trees. Like streams. Oh, some of you are like, no. Okay, here's what happened. One guy had the turban thing around his head. John Kerry's like, <laughs> they're all like, they start clapping for themselves. And then they all stand up clapping for themselves. They're, they're, my mom used to go talk to trees. My mom would go out in the woods and go, oh, Stephen, I talked to the trees this morning. I said, well, mom, what did they have to say? They told me to tell you, Stephen, I like you, but I don't, I love you, but I don't like you. I'm like, that's what the tree said? Yeah, mom. Was it an oak? No, it was a maple. Trees don't talk. Okay, they don't, they don't talk. Streams don't talk. But they want to make a bill of rights for streams and for trees and for plants. They don't want you to eat meat anymore. They, they, they only want you to eat a, a, a head of broccoli because you're hurting it. Broccolis are raised in the dirt. They grow up in the dirt. They should have a better life. They shouldn't end up on your plate. They shouldn't end up in your stomach. They shouldn't end up in your digestive juices. They shouldn't end up in your large intestine, swell going down to your small intestine, mixing itself with other fecal matter that's in there, and finally hits your colon and exits out your rectum. Broccoli should have a better life than that. I don't say that. These dipsticks say this. And they're making the rules. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. Real quick. Yeah, real quick. Here's a few examples of free thinkers. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was a free thinker. Brilliant, no doubt. His IQ was off the charts. Theory of relativity, theory of, uh, uh, of thermodynamics, all these different theories. Einstein was above his, you know, but 
he deemed the author of these principles. Here, here, here's the quote. I wrote it down. The word God is for me nothing more than the expression and product of human weakness. The Bible, a collection of honorable, but still primitive, which are nevertheless pretty childish. Who do you think gave Albert Einstein intelligence? God. Man hasn't discovered anything that God doesn't want man to discover. You get that? How did Noah know how to build that ark? I mean, think about it. 120 years he built, a, built that ark. No power saws. No pneumatic nailers. How do you know that? God gave him the intelligence. Another one, Robert Frost. I never met him. He's dead. Robert Frost, great poet, you know, wrote all these beautiful things about nature and about, and he received so many awards. He, uh, he received a very prestigious award, if I remember correctly, from the U.S. government with some, some mucky muck thing that the government gives out to other mucky muck people. But Robert Frost was an atheist. He denounced the creator, God. And then finally, one last one. This one you probably know. Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger, the mother of Planned Parenthood back in the 50s, I believe, or 40s, 50s, back that way. See, here's what she did. She was a free thinker. Really what she wanted to do is, and it's, I'm not saying this out of school, this is what she says. She wanted to wipe out the black population. That's what she said. We have to get rid of the colored people. So we will just abort them. And we'll say it's women's health. But she's a free thinker. So here's how it works. She denied the existence of life at conception so that they could get rid of these things. And by denying the existence of life at creation, you therefore deny existence of life, period. Because life begins at conception. But we've allowed it, we've allowed it to turn a different way. And that's why our children today feel like they're worthless. That's why they're growing up in a worthless society with no hope, where they're told that they're nothing and that they need to use a pronoun instead of their name or instead of he or she. They should pick a pronoun that fits them better. That's why some of them walking around saying they're, that they're dogs, or some of them walking around saying they're cats, or some of them walking around saying they're uh, furries, or some of them that are walking around saying this or that. Why? Because there's, they've lost humanity. The long con is paying off right now. The devil is reaping a huge harvest. And it's time that we look at it and realize that the only way for the, the, the hope for our country or for this world is Jesus Christ. That's the only way. It's the only way. What Stephen said in, in Acts thousands of years ago is so true today. They came to celebrate, look what we have done. Look what we have made with our own hands. Capiche? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray, Father, for your hand upon every life here, those at home, that might watch this. I pray, God, that you would move and touch our lives and draw us near. <clears throat> Father, there's a lot of deception. There's a lot of blindness. There's a lot of hardened hearts. There's a lot of veils that cover our souls. I pray, Lord Jesus, that that would be all ripped away. I pray for those that once knew you who have walked away. I pray, God, that they come back. I pray, Father, for hope and for salvation to come and be received. With your heads bowed for just a moment, we do this every week. We give people the opportunity to pray and begin their journey in walking with Jesus Christ. And if you would like to pray with me, I'm going to ask you in a moment just to look at me. And once I make eye contact with you, you can close your eyes. But I want to pray for you. Afterwards, David's going to be up here. Mark's going to be up here. they got some information for you. They'd like to give it to you. But I would like to pray with you right now. If you want to start this journey, as I talked about earlier in the sermon, if you want to surrender, I want to help you. I, I want to give you the start. 
on my right. If you want to pray that with me today, look at me right now. I'm all you got to see is your eyes. Sure. Got them. Any others? My left. Sure. Got them. Cool. Pray this from your heart. Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I surrender my life. I ask that you come in. Forgive me. Change me. Wash me and make me clean. I accept you in my heart today. Thank you for coming in. In Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen.